Hey, welcome to this afternoon's session on building reactive pipelines, or as I like to say, how to go from scalable apps to ridiculously scalable systems. Um, I normally, at this point, ask to get a, an audience selfie uh, so I can prove to my boss that I'm actually working. Uh, but he's here, so I don't have to do that, so that's cool. And my photography skills are terrible anyway, so nobody has to be embarrassed that like it's just a big blur. Like, And by nobody, I mean me. So. <laughs> So here we go. Um, these are my coordinates. If you want to need to ping me afterward, uh, by all means do so. I can be reached at either the two email addresses and you know half a dozen others. But the best way, the level best way to reach me is on Twitter at mkheck. Uh, if you're following me on Twitter, that's great. If you're not, why? Why? Uh, anyway, um, if you do have any questions, comments, or feedback, hopefully we'll have time at the end. But if we run short, see me afterward. If you don't think of something until 10 minutes after you walk off, that's fine, happens to me all the time. Ping me on Twitter. If you don't want to share with the world what you're thinking, DM me. My, my direct messages are open. So I'm, I'm an open book, and Twitter is the best way to flip the first page, the vir first virtual page. So with that, um, so whose boss has come to them and said, please do less with more? You did a great job last year. Well done. I'm going to double your budget. Please slow down. No one, right? That never happens. And if it is happening to you, I'd like to speak with you afterward because I'd really like to write up a case study on your, your position in your company. That's, that's awesome. But generally speaking, we're always asked to do more with less, or at the very best, more with the same amount of resources, right? This is universal when it comes to funding. It's universal when it comes to system resources as well. Uh, so why are we here? Well, we'll be discussing a couple of lines of thought, at least. Please notice I did not say threads. <laughs> but we'll be discussing a, a couple of lines of thought and weaving them together as we go. Um, I recently, and I mentioned this to, to some folks here, I had given this talk a couple of times before and got good feedback, but I just felt it wasn't as cohesive as I wanted, right? I, I wanted to, to like lead the, the, the breadcrumb trail all the way through, and I just felt like I was kind of in, having some breakpoints in there. So I refactored it entirely. And I've given it a couple of times since, varying settings and stuff. But this is still very much a new talk. So I would value your feedback again. Ping me on Twitter, DM me, whatever. Uh, just let me know if something, I, uh, something you were a little fuzzy on, maybe I skipped over it, uh, maybe I should focus on that more. I, I would appreciate hearing from you, so please. Uh, I would ask, though, that you would hold any questions until the end, uh, because I've got a lot of material I want to get through. And then again, we can do Q&A afterward, or out in the hall afterward, or later afterward, or whatever. Um, but we'll start with there. So this is kind of why we're here. We'll, we'll start off by talking about traditional approaches to scaling systems and where that takes us, you know, what we can do uh, within constraints typically that we're operating in every day. Uh, and then if we are fortunate enough to have a system that hits the wall, where do we go from there? What, how do we move that wall back, right, and extend those limits a bit? And then once we talk about this to some extent and kind of determine, yep, that makes sense, kind of I can see where this is going, we're going to code it because that way we can see it in action a little better. For me, I'm a very uh, tangible type of person. I like to see it in, you know, running. I like to see it working. So that's kind of where we're going. That's the template for, for the next hour-ish today. Uh, so who am I? A little bit about me. I have authored several blogs and blog posts. I've co-authored a couple of books. I've contributed content and code to several other books, a few of which even actually recognized my contributions. <laughs> that was nice, right? Uh, the others, well, don't buy those. Uh, um, I also have another book coming out. Uh, well, I, I've actually just signed a contract for another book. We'll get to that in a moment. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm an unreformed writer, I guess. I am an architect and developer. And as you might surmise from the next point where most of my expertise has been won, it's been in the Java ecosystem. Uh, some Groovy, a lot of Java, some Kotlin, right? Uh, I am a Java champion, Java 1 Rockstar, Groundbreak Ambassador. I've gotten a few other awards and honors that while I deeply appreciate them, they don't change the fact that I still have to buy my own coffee. I don't know who I need to see about that, but I, I've got to find somebody about that because I drink a lot of coffee. Uh, those of you who follow me on Twitter know that. And again, those of you who don't, why? Uh, anyway, uh, I am a professional problem solver. Uh, not my official title, it's just what I do, right? That's what you do, that's why we're all here, right? To learn how to solve problems better. Uh, officially, I am a Spring developer and advocate. Uh, I get to write code, I get to talk. I get to combine those two things and write code and talk. It's kind of, uh, for me, the ideal, ideal world. 
Uh, and I am also the sole creator and curator of Spring Noticias en Español. If you are un hispanohablante, talk to me, right? Come see me, talk to me afterwards, send me stuff. Because about a year ago, I noticed that there was no, Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world. And I didn't see any central place that we could share spring knowledge and Java and Kotlin and Maven and Gradle and all the good stuff. So I thought, I can, I can do something about that. I can play a small part to help disseminate that knowledge. So if you create materials in Spanish, blog posts, books, videos, whatever, Send it to me, let me amplify your voice, and we all get smarter together. If you're not a Spanish speaker, please ignore the last minute and a half that I just said. It's all good. So about that new book, um, <laughs> this is actually, as it says, not the real book, obviously. This is just a parody mock-up. Uh, I was trying to find a running monkey. That's me, the running monkey. Uh, but Spring Boot up and running. Hope you didn't come for good jokes. I don't have any. Uh, but yeah, I was looking for a way to, you know, I, I actually just signed uh, a deal on a book. I'll be starting it officially at the beginning of next year uh, to be published around August-ish. Uh, so I, I felt like there were some things I wanted to say that hadn't been captured in the way that I wanted to say them. So what the heck? It's, I do what everybody does. You uh, subject yourself to months of cruel torture and you publish a book. So uh, if you're interested, follow me on Twitter. That's where I make all the announcements. So. Uh, and I already feel myself getting dry. I had a talk right before lunch. Who came to that talk? And you came back. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, inexplicably. Uh, but I, I appreciate that. Uh, I had, I actually wore a Starfleet uniform. So those of you who missed that, look for the video if you want to see that. Um, what, a tweet, yes. <laughs> okay, I did tweet it too. Of course, follow me on Twitter. Uh, but I wanted to stay thematically consistent. So I, I stayed with a... Uh, Federation Space Camp shirt, so I hope you, uh, I, I am now a red shirt. Please don't lob projectiles in my direction. I'll just die on the spot. Uh, but, but yeah, so let's see, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but let's just charge on. The traditional approach to scaling systems. I like to take it all the way back to the beginning. Let's say you're working on a monolith, right? And this monolith is a monolith because what? It has a lot of different capabilities inside the monolith. So when any given monolith, it might provide bits of functionality for four or 10 or 27 different capabilities, right? And those capabilities are used and utilized to varying degrees. You'll have certain capabilities that that monolith provides that are used a lot, extensively being worn out how much they're being used. And you'll have other capabilities that the monolith exposes which are used almost not at all, right? And, and that's not a big deal as long as that monolith can serve your needs. But what happens when you need to scale? You typically will take that monolith and pick it up and drop in a duplicate of it. And then you say, now I have two. I have two of everything. And that's okay. But you're bringing along all those capabilities that are hardly ever used at all, and you're scaling those with the capabilities that are used absolutely extensively. And, and setting aside things like contention, because now you have two things that are trying to uh, save and retrieve data, whereas before you had one, so you have some other you know, issues at, at stake there too. But just the fact that you're dragging along all that extra baggage means it's, you know, it's very obvious it's probably not your optimal way to scale. So when you see that, when you run into that, I have a few notes. I want to make sure I don't blithely skip past all of, of, of a particular thing. But when you see that, you think, this seems like some of this cap these functionalities, these capabilities, would be a good candidate for what? A microservice. When you take a monolith and you start looking at maybe teasing out microservices, you don't start with the stuff that you don't need to worry about scaling or the stuff that never changes. You tease out the parts that you want to be able to address independently. So if you have a particular bit of functionality that's used a lot and you tease that out, you can scale that independent of the monolith, which solves some scaling issues. What you often find though is that a particular microservice isn't an island, right? Uh, because a service may have to communicate with another service and another service in order to provide capability A, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll, again, I like to take things down to the simplest example and then build them up from there. So let's take it very simple. We have service A, microservice A, and microservice B. And we access microservice A and we say, do something, give me something. And service A has one moment and it goes to service B and says, I need this calculation run so I can come back and provide this answer. 
service B goes and does this, sends the response back to service A, which dutifully provides it to us, the end user. We're sitting there, yay, I have my answer. I have my thing that I requested. And what you see when you see this pattern emerge is that the whole mic no microservice is an island. So service A and service B will, when you need to scale those, kind of usually need to scale together, right? Because for each time you need to spin up another instance of microservice A, you're probably going to need to scale up uh, microservice or scale out, I should say, microservice B roughly at the same rate because you have the same number of communication channels, if you will, going between the two. So you start to see this kind of locational coupling happen. Also temporal because if service A goes offline or an instance of service, or excuse me, service B goes offline, then what happens to all those requests that that instance of service A, the corresponding instance, is wanting to send? It's like, where, where did you go? So you start seeing that you've got some coupling going on locationally and temporally as well. At that point, you start thinking, boy, if there was only some way we could decouple those two microservices, microservice A and microservice B, because maybe microservice A really is just kind of like, yeah, I've got this request and I send it off and service B is doing all the hard work. So maybe you could actually, if you really stopped and thought about it, scale out your service A, whereas, or excuse me, the other way around, scale out your service B because it has to do more work, it takes longer to respond. So you start looking at things like messaging platforms. Messaging platforms uh, allow you to decouple things to some degree. Now several examples of messaging platforms exist, things like uh, RabbitMQ, Kafka, uh, each of the major cloud providers provide several different options as well. I like to kind of roll it up to one primary one for each, uh, but again your mileage may vary. So I tend to look at things like Amazon's Kinesis or Azure Event Hubs or Google Cloud, uh, Google's Cloud Pub Sub. Uh, and there are others, of course, too. So I kind of look at those as the top five. Uh, Kafka, RabbitMQ, Kinesis, Event Hubs, Cloud Pub Sub. At that point, you start kind of looking and saying, well, okay, what are the things that are important to me? Rabbit and Apache Kafka can be run pretty much anywhere. They can be hosted by the companies that kind of shepherd them. They can be hosted by other companies. They can be hosted by the, the big cloud providers as well. You can run them in-house. They're also open source. Kinesis, uh, Event Hubs, Cloud Pub Sub are not. Maybe that's very critically important to you. Maybe it's not. But that's something else to take into account, right? Um, let's see. What else do I want to cover? The messaging platforms, I should say, because if, if you, you have service A and it places a message into a pipeline, and I do try to stay at that higher level terminology, so that I don't devolve into rabbit speak or Kafka speak or what have you. Uh, so when I say pipeline, map it to your particular uh, chosen technology. But if service A places a message into the pipeline and, and service B grabs that message, service B doesn't even need to be online when that message hits the pipeline, does it? When it comes online, service A may not be online. It just it grabs the message. And it doesn't need to know that it came from this instance of service A. It just says, hey, look, I have a message. I need to consume that. And it consumes it. Uh, it also allows you, if service B, you need to scale that out, it's independent of service A. If one service A can stuff the pipeline with more than a single service B can process, you can scale out your service B, right? So that decouples things temporally and locationally and, and allows you to scale independently as well. But getting back to the, uh, to the different, um, different messaging platforms, it would be wonderful, a wonderful world, if you could standardize on one of anything, right? So let's say your company standardized on RabbitMQ. Are you done? Maybe not. You have any partners? You ever acquire a company? You ever been acquired by a company? What happens if you have a partner who's using Kafka? This you know, company X, they're using Kafka, and you're using RabbitMQ. Do you just tell them everything has to switch, or you can't partner? No. What we typically do is we have to work together. It would be really nice if there was some way that we could abstract above the, the nitty gritty of each one while still gaining access to all of that if we need to, but to, to deal at that higher level of abstraction so we can be more productive. And it turns out there is a way, and that's Spring Cloud Stream. Spring Cloud Stream gives you a lot more productivity and versatility. It also uh, gives you tools for resilience and, and other things that, uh, again, make you more productive and make your systems more robust. What makes a lot of this possible is the concept of binders. So you have a binder for each particular different messaging platform that you can be dealing with with Spring Cloud Stream. And there are certain patterns that are implemented as well, which I'll get into as we go. Uh, but Spring Cloud Stream allows you to stay at that higher level of abstraction, again, until or unless you need to dive below that, and only in those circumstances where you need or want to do so. 
There are, uh, and I frequently forget to mention this, so I just scan my notes, there are a lot of different binders, and many of which the Spring team maintains. So things like uh, Apache Kafka and RabbitMQ and Kinesis. We are also have partner maintained binders. Uh, so Google's Cloud Pub Sub, the binder for that is maintained by Google. They're our partner. Uh, Azure's Event Hub's uh, binder is maintained by Microsoft, as you might imagine. Then we have community-based binders. So they will be created, maintained by different companies, organizations, individuals who have a specific need that may not be filled by others in the community. You can write your own binder. It's not overly difficult, right? Uh, and if you do, that's great. If you find something that's community maintained, or maybe you find something that has in the past been, and you can take that up and use it, that's great as well. But there are a lot of different binders out there that you can leverage for your applications. And I'm getting raspy already. Uh, too much Klingon earlier. I actually did speak a little bit of Klingon earlier. I'm, I'm even worse at that than Spanish and even worse than English. So anyway, so again, breaking this down to a kind of a simple example, uh, at the very highest level, this is kind of what we're talking about, right? You'll have different services that will talk to each other and they'll pass messages through pipelines. Uh, within Spring Cloud Stream, there are three pre-built or pre-configured interfaces, a source, a processor, and a sync. There are, it's easy enough to create your own. You just define an interface. Uh, you have one or more subscribable channels, one or more message channels for your gazentas and gazautas, and you're off and running. But as with all things Spring, it's opinionated. So based on the pre-configurations, based on the, the predetermined settings, uh, you have some things that are exposed by default that solve probably 80 to 90% of your use cases, right? Uh, you have a source, and the source is the thing that produces values. You have a sync, and that's the thing that consumes values. It consumes a value, that's the end of the line. No more processing is done on that value. In between, you may have one or more processors. Processors are transformers. They'll grab a value, they'll transform in some way and pass it on to its processors further downstream or sinks. And you can mix and match and arrange these in different ways so you can come up with some pretty complex patterns right out of the box. But again, if you need to extend, you can. I'm showing this with RabbitMQ because that's what I'm going to be using for my examples. But again, if you like Kafka, Kinesis, whatever, all works the same uh, in terms of the concepts that I'm talking about. So we've done all the things that we think we should do, right? We've taken our monolith, we've teased out the, the very volatile and very uh, highly demanded uh, bits, of cap uh, bits of functionality, the capabilities, and we've implemented some messaging platforms. So we're passing messages. We've decoupled even our microservices that were somewhat tightly coupled before. Uh, so we've got, you know, we're, we're scaling pretty well at this point, right? Now what? Well, if we hit the wall, I mean, that may be enough. And if that's enough, you're done. Feel free to leave, that's good. But if you happen to have a wildly successful distributed application, oh, that we should all be punished so badly, right? But if you do have that, what next? And that's where we start looking at different approaches to scaling. In the Java ecosystem, and I'm, I'm going to be not specifically speaking about coroutines at this point. We can talk about that offline later if you're interested. But, or fibers, by the way. Uh, but traditionally within the Java ecosystem, you've had a, your, your method for scaling is for each additional request, you spin up an additional thread. And that works pretty well to a point, right? And it's certainly easier to reason about than some options. Uh, but what happens is you typically have n number of threads that you can leverage. And performance creeps up, but it's, you know, it's mostly consistent. Until you hit that n plus one request, then what? Hockey stick time, right? Because that n plus one request does what? It has to wait. It's waiting for another opening, another thread to be freed. And at that point, the performance profile goes out the window. Now, what are most of those n threads doing at any given point in time? Nothing. They're blocking. <laughs> so they're waiting for a response. You've got a service who's, who's making a request. They're waiting for a response from a database call or from another service or what have you. So they're really not overly active either. So it's not terribly efficient. Easier to reason about, not terribly efficient. Uh, reactive programming changes things up. It, it embraces an asynchronous approach, approach uh, but it's not just asynchronicity, right? Because with reactive programming, you have back pressure. And I'll get into that in a, mo in a moment as well. But instead of thinking in terms of connections, and instead of thinking of my n threads, what you do is you scale with a small number of threads. And you have a scheduler that keeps those hot, alive at all times, right? So you more fully, fully utilize the resources at your disposal. 
Uh, this allows you to go wider, if you will. There are some performance gains to be, to, to be realized there. Uh, for instance, if you have service A calling service B, but also calling service C, D, E, and F, right? B, C, D, E. Let's go with those. That's four. And each one of those requests takes a minimum of one second. In an imperative world, service A makes a request to service B, waits, gets the answer, makes a request to service C, waits, gets the answer. So for four requests, what's your minimum response time from service A? Four seconds, right. Wayne's on to me. He saw the, the hint. Uh, so if you could do those concurrently, and each one took a second, what's your minimum response time? If service A says service B, service C, service D, service E, oh, now I have all the responses, collect, pass them on. What's your minimum response time now? One second, right. So there are some potential performance gains. That's not the focus, right? Because that's specific to certain cases. Other cases, you'll see no performance gains, maybe even slight performance degradation, because if you have a very small number of requests, obviously blocking works really well. It's just like, I'm sending a request, and I'm waiting. As soon as you have it, I've got it. So it depends on your use case. However, there are some gains to be, to be had. But scaling, this is what it's all about, because you can scale to a much greater number of threads with a very flat, or number of requests, excuse me, with a very flat performance profile. So, uh, inter project reactor. There are numerous different reactive streams implementations. And I'll get into reactive streams here momentarily. Project reactor is arguably the best one in existence. I'll, I admit I'm a bit biased. But I do think if you do your research, you'll find that a lot of companies and organizations have standardized around a reactor first or reactor only approach. That says something, right? And I do think it makes a lot of sense because if you're coming from a spring world, it's a very natural progression to start using reactive programming because we don't drastically break the model, right? We keep a fairly consistent model coming from spring MVC to spring web flux. Get into that as well here momentarily too. But there's not a huge cognitive load when you're switching. It's not a check your brain at the door, do everything differently. It's here's a bit of an extension to your current knowledge that you can use and gain some performance and scalability. So I, I appreciate that. Um, it would also be really cool if this integrated with messaging platforms. If there are any synergies to be gained between the two, that would be wonderful, right? So we'll see. OK. I know there have been a lot of talks about reactive programming, uh, but for those of you who are still a little fuzzy on the concept, I really like this quote by Rossin Stoyanchev. He's one of our project, project Reactor team members. Uh, I, I share this quote every time I do this presentation and one other presentation, much to Rossin's chagrin, but I love it, so I'm going to keep doing it. So sorry, Rossin. Uh, <laughs> but in a nutshell, reactive programming is about non-blocking event-driven applications that scale with a small number of threads with back pressure is a key ingredient that aims to ensure producers do not overwhelm consumers. It packs a lot of meat into one sentence, which is why I keep showing it, right? But let's unpack it a bit. I mentioned already, we're not dealing with n number of threads. We're dealing with a small number of threads and a scheduler to keep those threads hot at all times. So I've kind of already talked about the non-blocking event-driven applications. There's no blocking. Nobody's sitting on a thread and hogging it. I will come back to a special case with a special scheduler later, assuming there's time. If not, please see me afterward, uh, because for the foreseeable future, the world is not entirely 100% reactive end to end. That's a fact. And there are ways to address that as well, so stay tuned. Uh, scaling with a small number of threads, already covered that. Back pressure, because when you just look at the first couple things there, it sounds a lot like asynchronous programming. Anyone done asynchronous programming? Yeah, okay, those are the people who have the look of despair in their eyes, right? Uh, sometimes referred to as callback hell, if you have your nested callbacks, and you get a very complex, just, it's terrible, right? It looks really ugly. Uh, I'm convinced that the person who coined that term was an optimist, because I think it's actually worse than that. If you've had to do much asynchronous programming, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the other thing, if, if you're just talking about a, a asynchronous programming type of approach, uh, you don't always have a declarative approach, right? I guess that's where I'm going with, uh, with that. But you also have, besides the lack of readability, you also have no way for a slower consumer to say, look, you're, you're killing me. You're, you're giving me way more than I can handle. Because if you have a consumer that can only process 10 values per second, and you have a producer who's producing 1,000 values per second, what happens to that poor, slow consumer? 
it just falls over and dies, right? We lose more good, good consumers that way. Um, but with back pressure, what it allows you to do, your consumer can say, look, I can only handle 10, give me 10. And when I'm done processing those 10, I'll request 10 more. So it allows you to keep that slower consumer alive. Now, it doesn't change the fact you have a very fast producer producing 1,000 values per second, but what it does do is shift the control from a, an iPhone client two countries over to your cloud service that you actually have some control over. Now, that means that you, for the other 990 values, what do you do? You have that control. You can define, do I want to buffer those? Do I want to sample those? Do I want to discard those? If we're talking about, for instance, like a, a dashboard, we don't care what happened three minutes or three hours or three days ago. We care about the system status now. So maybe you just drop them. You just eliminate them. But that is back in your hands with the proper reactive programming approach. So uh, let's see. Let's dive on in. All this is based on the reactive streams initiative. Uh, in the battle days, everybody just came up with their own solutions, completely incompatible. And then who was stuck in the middle? We were, right? <laughs> Trying to implement stuff, make this talk to that. It was very, those were very dark times. Uh, but now, of course, we actually get along a little bit better. I think everybody tries to cooperate in the industry better. That's a good thing, right? So several companies came together to determine what we should do in terms of reactive streams, because that's where your scaling issues a lot of times happen are in the streams. So the Reactive Streams Initiative was born out of a meeting or meetings among companies like um, uh, Twitter, Kazing, Netflix, Red Hat, Lightbin, Pivotal, you know, tiny players like that. But we all got together and said, look, we may have different ways of solving this problem, but we want them to be interoperable. And the Reactive Streams Initiative consists of four things. One is the textual spec, right? Here's what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, one is the API. One is the examples for how to build an implementation based on the API. And then one is the TCK that lets you determine how compliant you are. This is the API. It also consists of four things. Four interfaces, right? You have a publisher, the thing that produces values, objects of type T, for instance. You have a subscriber, the thing that consumes those objects of type T. A subscription is the contract entered into between subscriber and publisher. And then a processor actually incorporates the subscriber and the publisher because it'll receive a value, manipulate it in some way, pass it on. Sound familiar? Now, I, I should say, these are interfaces. So you can't use this out of the box. You have to either create an implementation or use one. That's where Project Reactor comes in. We looked at that, and the way we wanted to approach things is, if you look at standard imperative Java or Kotlin, let's say you're returning something from a method. You return a, an object of type T, so a thing or maybe an iterable of type T, a collection of things. Same thing kind of applies. If you have a publisher, maybe you want to return zero or one value. You know, it's either there or you have one value coming back. That's what's called a mono in Webflux speak. If you have zero to n values, maybe a small collection, or maybe an indeterminate number of items coming back over an indefinite amount of time, that's a flux. Mono, flux. Some operations apply to both, some don't but it made sense to distinguish between the two. The flux is where the Spring Web Flux name came from, right? Kind of makes sense. So Spring Web MVC, Spring Web Flux. So, all right. This is what I think is really cool. Boy, that blue does not show up on there well at all. There's a great amount of parallel here, right? Because we're still talking about streams and values coming in, values going out, values being transformed. So a, in Spring Cloud Stream parlance, a source roughly correlates with a publisher. And a sync roughly correlates with a subscriber. It's the thing that consumes those values. A processor corresponds to a, well, a processor, right? It's still a transformer. And then the pipeline itself serves the role of a subscription. It's the connection between a publisher and a subscriber. So it seems like we have some synergies that we could leverage here, right? So let's try it. Let's, let's code. Does anyone recognize this guy? Really? Nobody. Okay, a few. Those of you who don't, I mean, I hope the material I'm going to present is good and that you're getting something out of it, but if you forget everything else, don't forget this. This is Maurice Moss from the IT crowd. Please go home this weekend and binge watch it on Netflix. You'll be glad you did. Uh, so, okay. Let's code. How am I doing on time? When did, I, when did we start? Two. We've got tons of time. This is great. Okay. So let me exit that and change this to mirror 
And Bob's your uncle. We're off and running. Okay, so let's maximize that. And here, here we go. Does anyone recognize this? A couple people, yeah. This is the spring initializer. I don't know if you've realized this or not. I get excited, excited about the smallest things, but look, it has a dark UI now. I really actually almost always use the dark UI, but I do think this shows up better, so we'll, we'll go with light for now. But um, I'm going to just start off and keep create, again, three simple services. So uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with the Spring Initializer, you even have choices there based upon you know, how you want to create your project. If, you're, uh, if you like to use Maven, if you're a Maven developer, you can generate a Maven project. Uh, if you're a hipster, you can generate a Gradle project. That's fine. Uh, my, my hoodie's behind me, so I, I, I we'll stay with Maven for now. Uh, I'm going to go with Java again, because, you know, why not? I did Kotlin earlier. Well, actually, Kotlin and Gradle, now that I think about it. So we'll do Maven and Java. Uh, and I'm going to change this to the hecklers, uh, because I can, and we'll create a source. And then, let's see, what do we need? We're going to bring in uh, Reactive Web, and we're going to bring in the Reactive Web dependency. And let's see, so Cloud Stream, Reactive Cloud Stream, because we're going to Hello. Oh, happier. All right. And then I'm going to bring in RabbitMQ dependency, Spring for RabbitMQ. Because if you look at the Reactive Cloud Stream dependency, it tells you this requires a binder. Because you, you're saying you want to interact with a messaging platform, but I have to be able to bind to a messaging platform. I mean, it kind of, kind of makes sense. So it gives you that little tip. And because I'm a lazy developer, I'm going to use Lombok. Lazy good, not lazy bad. I just want to be clear about that. Um, I don't necessarily strongly encourage folks to use Lombok in production. It has pros, it has cons. But for demos, it's awesome, right? Because I can focus on the stuff I want to focus on. So all right, I'm going to generate that. And uh, yeah, we'll just save that. And just because uh, I tend to narrate extensively as I code, I'm going to go ahead and create my projects now to save a bit of time downstream. We'll create our processor, and we'll create our sync. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and open this. We'll unzip our, our, actually, the way the initializer works, you choose your dependencies. It brings in your starters. It zips everything up. You pull it down. You open it up. And, uh, or you unzip it, I should say. Then you open it up. And where did it go? There it is, source. Hello. And we'll open that in our favorite IDE, NetBeans. <laughs> 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 Kidding. <laughs> Any NetBeans fans here? I, that is not a setup, by the way. NetBeans is an awesome IDE. Uh, NetBeans has great Spring and Spring Boot support. Uh, it really is good. Uh, so if you're a NetBeans user, be loud and proud. It's all good. Uh, NetBeans is, an, is a great IDE. Uh, any Eclipse users here? Eclipse is also a uh, <laughs> Eclipse is also an IDE. I'm only partially kidding. Eclipse really is a super capable IDE, but it always kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you've seen the, the memes with the Swiss Army knife with 500 blades. And it's like, I know I can do this. I just can't find the blade to do it. Uh, I, I, all kidding aside, we have a build of Eclipse called Spring Tool Suite, which has some really, really spectacular uh, cloud deployment capabilities in it. So anytime I see those, I go, oh, that looks really nice. Uh, I tend to go with IntelliJ because I do some, well, quite a bit of Kotlin programming. Uh, so of course, the folks who bring you IntelliJ are JetBrains. The folks who shepherd Kotlin development are JetBrains. So you might imagine it's got some really good, uh, good stuff there. So, uh, but we're going to use IntelliJ. Uh, use what makes you happy. Use Vim if you want. But please, please, do not use Emacs. <laughs> Have some self-respect. Okay. So I'm going to go first to my application properties. And let's see, server.port. Can you read that in the back? Let's, uh, I, I, I do this with some trepidation. Font, and let's go down here. I've already changed the high contrast because that pops a little bit better. But we're going to take this up to high contrast and biggest. Oh, that's much better. And then we'll close that out. Nice. OK. So just to start off, our application.properties uh, allows us to set some sensible defaults for application. Uh, you can, of course, externalize those in your environment, as you probably would in many cases in your production environment. But again, for today, we're just going to do this and get things up and running very quickly. So I'm going to set the server port equal to 0, because for a Spring Boot application, uh, upon initialization, it says, oh, Spring, the start server port, <laughs> talking faster than I can think, 
The server port setting it equal to zero just means find a random port and start up on that. So I don't have to worry about port conflicts for my, my applications here today. So I'm also going to set my Spring Cloud Stream bindings. Now this is my source, and a source has one predefined channel, which is output, right? The source is the thing that produces values and sends them, it frees them. So it needs an output channel by default. So we're going to bind to our output channel, and I'm going to set my destination equal to, and I'll just call this processor, it doesn't matter what you call it, but this is the channel I'm gonna use, my pipeline, if you will. Uh, so let's see, I also need to define, or will be defining my Spring Cloud Stream function definition, and we'll come back to that momentarily. So I do want to say that I'm kind of, this is on where the API for Spring Cloud Stream is and is leaning, right? So if you're used to an annotation-driven approach to Spring Cloud Stream, it's, it's actually evolving kind of to a more, uh, fewer annotations, more automatic configuration that seems to work very, very nicely, as I think you'll see as we go. So let's go to our main application class. Now, every time I give a demo, Every time I write code, I try to follow that great life advice that they always tell you, right? Do what you love. So I love coffee. So most of my applications that I write, anytime I show somebody something, coffee is involved. The problem is I, I do a lot of coffee talks that way, and, and people seem to always have the jitters when they left. So I was starting to think of something else I could do a talk on, some other area that I enjoyed. And I thought, well, maybe even if I don't necessarily enjoy it, if I have significant domain knowledge, I should be able to use that, right? I fly a lot. Those of you who follow me on Twitter know that, right? I, I, they point the cannon in a different direction and send me. They just shoot me out of it. And I land somewhere, and then I present. It's a lot of fun. Um, but as a frequent flyer, I have some domain knowledge of it. And I thought, how could I make the airlines a better place? How could I write systems that would help the airlines not be so suboptimal. So I thought, let's do some apps that will help with that. So I'm going to just create a class here, and, and we're going to track passengers from the time they check in with a desk agent or online. Uh, you buy a ticket, right? You, you buy a, a, an opportunity to fly. But until you actually check in, you're not a passenger, you're just a customer. But once you check in, you're a passenger. Then you go to, to security, and you get probed, and Worse, and then once you pass that, assuming you do pass that, you're a flying passenger. You've earned the privilege of flying on that airline that day, no matter how good or bad that may be. Then you're a flying passenger. Once you get to the gate agent and they scan your boarding pass and you walk onto the plane, that's when you've officially arrived. That's when the beatings begin. But we are going to try to improve that, right? So we're gonna check in with our passengers and we're gonna follow them through the entire process. So our passenger, again, I'm gonna use Lombok because I'm lazy. Uh, so we make this an app value class. So that means it's a data class. Uh, it also means you have a, an all args constructor. So your uh, constructor with all parameters, with a parameter for each member variable, and then your getter setters equals hash code two string, uh, things like that. So, you know, semi-useful. So uh, private final string, ID and name, that will be, I think, sufficient for what we need. Uh, let's see, now we can, this is our source, right? So we can either generate passengers to send in and do it manually, or again, lazy, I'm going to create a component, a passenger generator to do that for us. <laughs> okay, so uh, what do I need to do here? Let's see, I will want to create a uh, list of string. I'm still in my, my Klingon Kotlin mode here, so I'm having to kind of back up and make sure I don't go down the wrong path here. So we've got a list of string. We'll call these names equals. Uh, so we have arrays, arrays dot as list. So we need some names. Well, Artem showed up and he's in the front row, so sorry. Sorry, buddy. You're in there. Okay. Um, let's see. What's your name, sir? <coughs> Uh, I see, I knew your name. You were reading it to me and I still misspelled it. Ah, oh, this is just, it's been a long month this week. Uh, great week though. All right, so let's see. Um, Ma'am, what's your name? Yes. Oh, Elsa, thank you so much for making this easy for me to spell. My name is Mark. I always feel like when somebody gives me a hard name to spell and then I, they, what's yours, Mark? It's four letters. I feel like I've let them down. What's your name, ma'am? Shelly, can you spell that for me? Would you spell that for me? 
S-H-E-L-L-E? Two E's. All right, excellent. Uh, let's see, you, sir, in the red shirt. Yes, what's your name? Okay, I'm trying to remember. Gal Ron, like that? Yeah, yeah, I, I just, it's spelling. Spelling's hard. Okay. Uh, so we've got almost enough, but uh, I'm going to stick me in there because I don't like to use anybody else as a bad example. You know, if, if I pick on me and, and you see how things go south really badly with me because I'm going to try to keep it real, uh, I don't want anybody else, I don't, I don't want Elsa to be stuck in an overhead bin. So we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> Not that that's ever happened. So, uh, whoops, let's see. And, yeah, that's fine. Uh, private. Uh, and then random R&D equals new random. So we'll get some randomness in here. Now, to generate our passengers, uh, let's see. So what I want to do is passenger uh, generate uh, return. Uh, so new passenger, and we'll use uid.random.toString to give us our ID, and we'll take our names and we'll do a get. We we'll use random, oops, typing counts. Uh, next int, we'll use the length of our names, the size, and there we go. So we have our passenger generator here, so that's not terrible. Now we need to get these values that we're going to generate into our pipeline, right? So at least for the time being, we're going to enable binding to our source. Do, 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 source messaging. There we go, source class. And this will be our desk agent. That's where it all kicks off and gets real. So uh, let's see, I need to private final uh, source. I'm going to inject my source and I'm also going to inject my uh, final passenger generator and we'll call this generator. Now, I can do field injection, but that's evil. If you haven't read Ollie Dropbaum's excellent article on that, appropriately titled, Field Injection is Evil, please do so, it's really a great work. Uh, but we can also create a constructor, so we can do constructor injection. Or, again, lazy, we'll let Lombok do it for us. So all our constructor and our problems go away, at least for now. So now, uh, let's see, we need to create a bean. Not a bean, a, whew, typing's going downhill fast. For those of you who were not in my first session, you do know, or you will know, that I count on the front row to catch my typos before I hit build. I bet you're rethinking your seating choices now, aren't you? Okay. okay, so we're going to create a bean. And this bean should implement what? This seems a lot, you know, this is the source. We're going to push values into our pipeline. This seems a lot like a supplier, right? Oh, I must have hit caps lock. There we go. So it seems a lot like a supplier, so we could supply passengers. We can also, if we really want to go meta, we can supply a flux of passengers because that way we're dealing with a stream of passengers, not just a passengers as we continue to progress. So we're going to create a supplier to supply flux of passengers. We'll call this uh, check-in. And let's see, return uh, source dot output dot send. Am I doing this right? Am I just having a moment? No, I'm not doing this right. Um, yeah, so I'm, again, yes, I am. <laughs> so a supplier is what? A supplier is a functional interface with a single abstract method. And since Java 8, what can you do when you have a functional interface with a single abstract method? You can write this as a lambda, right? So return flux, flux dot, oops, <sighs> yes, so sorry, supplier. So we're going to uh, create this. We're, you create a flux using an interval. Duration, we'll set a duration of seconds so we can produce one per second. And then we're going to map each of these pulses, right? This is just a long value you're creating, once per second. And we're going to map each one of these to a new passenger. Uh, so actually, in this case, we have a generator handy, so we're just going to generate that. And this is sufficient, right? But it's not really better practices because I know we're only producing one value per second, but what if we had a really super, super slow consumer? What if we have back pressure? So you should always define what happens in terms of back pressure. So on back pressure, you can define buffers, you can set your buffer size and what have you, but we're just going to drop the intervening values. At one per second, I don't think we have much to worry about. Okay, so that gets us where we need to go. Uh, and actually, let's me completely eliminate this. 
Yes, this is the problem when you think in multiple coroutines. Uh, okay, so that gets us our source set up. We have something that'll work. Let's go ahead and develop our processor and our sync and take it from there. So we open our processor project. There we go. So nice, okay. The next thing we do is go to our application properties. Once again, server port zero so we don't have port conflicts. We set up our bindings. Now in this case, this is a processor, so it has two channels by default, an input channel and an output channel. So we're gonna define our input channel destination. Coming in, if we go back here to our source, we see that the output destination was processor, so that is where we're going to be listening as well. We also, let me just close that, we also can define our group. Now, if we don't define a group, if we don't add this particular uh, instance of this particular service to a group, let's say we spin up another processor and it's listening to the same pipeline, if you will. What happens? Everybody gets a copy of every message. And that's what's called a fan out. And if you're trying to implement a fan out pattern, that's wonderful. If you're trying to scale, that's not so much so. Because what you want to do is add them to the same consumer group. That allows you to implement the competing consumer pattern and take turns, right? So if you have two consumers in the same group, they alternate. If you have three, they take turns. If you have 10. So it allows you roughly to scale to that same extent. So we add any future instances of this to the same consumer group. I'm also going to be indicating what my function definition is, which reminds me, front row, I forgot to go back and define that earlier, didn't I? Look at that. So we have our check-in function. We'll go back and plug that in here. That becomes very important later on, so bear with me. All right, so same thing here. We don't have our function yet, so let's go ahead and open our application. And we know coming in we're going to have passengers, right? Passenger. So private final string, ID and name, name. Okay, and then we also, this is a processor, so we'd also know we're going to be transforming this. Once we've gone from the desk agent and we go through TSA or your whichever country's security apparatus and you make it through, somehow miraculously you make it through and you even have most of your own bags with you still, you walk to the gate, at which time you're greeted by a gate agent, right? So this is our class uh, gate agent. And let's see, we'll make this at value as well. So similar things, uh, actually I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is, uh, this is our flying passenger because this is what we're going to be transforming our passenger into. Same applies, private final string, ID and name. We still have the same properties, but now we have more, right? Because once you get to the gate, what the gate agent should do is over, out of some percentage, I mean, all customers are valued, right? Yeah, clearly you fly on different airlines than I do, if, if that's the case. But, but all customers should be valued. So they should have a status, statue, Ooh. a status of valued. But let's say we want to choose randomly a certain percentage of our customers that we want to surprise and delight. So we kick it up a notch, right? We want to choose, let's say, one in five or one in 10 or whatever it is, and make them, recognize them as our premium customers. And maybe we give them an extra, maybe we give them a cup with their water, I don't know. But whatever the case may be, we want to let them know that we care, right? We're an airline, we care. Uh, so we should have a status here. We will transform these into flying passengers. Everybody gets a status. You get a status, I get a status. Uh, so we have a status and that's good. Now we need to, here we'll enable binding to our processor, yep. Uh, dot class, and this will be our desk, no, our gate agent, right? This is where it gets fun. Now, we're going to create a bean here. This is a function. A function transforms types, right? So an object of type T or an object of type R. So we could transform our passengers to flying passengers, but let's treat them as a stream, a reactive stream. So we have a flux of passengers, and let's transform that flux of passengers into a flux of flying passengers. There we go. And we'll call this, uh, let's see, we'll call this greet passenger. Passenger, all right. So, uh, a function is a flux. Yes? Why, why one oh, a supplier just supplies values. A function transforms them. So in this case, this is our processor. So we'll get a value, transform it, and we'll pass it on to our downstream processor slash sinks. 
So now our a function, once again, functional interface, single abstract method. We're going to use a lambda, so we take a flux and we do a flux.map. We're going to map each passenger to a new flying passenger, right? So we'll take our pax.id, pax.getName. And, oh, I need some randomness in here, right? Because we've got to break this out somehow. So uh, private final random rnd equals new random. Sweet. All right. So, so we'll do a random.nextInt. Uh, and let's say out of every five, right? So if that equals zero, not nine, <laughs> then we will surprise and delight this passenger. So status.premium. Otherwise, everybody's valued, right? So status.valued. Okay, so that's not terrible, right? So now we just take our greet passenger. We indicate that this is our function definition. And now we're done with our processor, at least for the time being. So let's go now and go back and create our sync and open that. All right, so once again, application properties, server port zero. Now, this is our sync. It has one input channel, right? And that's one channel, and that's an input channel. So spring cloud stream bindings input input destination equals sync. We call that sync in our processor, right? Uh, let's see, that's our source. There's our processor. Oh, we didn't even define that. Look at that. So spring cloud stream. I don't know where my head is today. So output destination equals sync. We don't need a group here because this is where we're pushing values out, not bringing them in. We're not consuming them. So it doesn't make any sense to set up a consumer group when we're sending them out. But here, of course, it does. So we set our group here. And then we also spring cloud stream function definition, which we'll come back to in a moment. Application. Now, our transformer, our processor, took in passengers and sent out flying passengers, right? So that's all we care about here. That's all we'll be receiving is flying passengers. Private, final. Um, and actually, before I do that, we'll say enum status, boom, valued, premium, private, final, string, string. Wow, I need to slow down. String ID name there we go private final status status perfect okay all right so now we just bind at at enable binding to our sync dot class class now this this is our flight attendant right uh, so flight attendant and let's see, so we need to create a bean, and this is a consumer. A consumer takes in a value, that's it. It just consumes and that's the end of the line. And we're going to consume a flux of flying passengers. Right? And we'll call this, eh, we'll just call this log. It sure beats beat, right? Okay, so, uh, so this is a consumer, right? So we will just do, a consumer is functional interface, single abstract method. So we'll do a flux, 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 dot subscribe and we'll just print this out so let's start this by the way i am running rabbit locally in a docker container but if you're pointing this to a cloud cloud hosted instance that's fine too if you're using kafka that's fine too it, it's all good i'm just doing this again for expediency so i've got my sync up and running uh so so this is oh you know except for one thing because once again i didn't eh, i need to change this to log passenger just to keep things clean. Lack of ambiguity is a good thing. All right, so we go back to our source, our processor. We start our processor. We flip over to our source. And IntelliJ is being weird again, so we'll just do it the uh, hard way. Source, and we'll run that. Hard way. It's three fingers uh, instead of just one <laughs> or two. Okay, so we're running. Our source is running. We go back here, we see that we're getting values through our processor, and then we go to our sync and we see that, yes, indeed, we are getting values. We have our passengers all the way into the plane. And most of them are valued passengers, but occasionally we have a premium passenger. That passenger has one life's lottery, right? Okay, 
So that's cool, and that was fairly easy to set up in a fairly short amount of time. But there's yet more, okay? So, and we have four minutes, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit the wall on this. So what happens if we want to do more? I'm going to go back to my source, we'll stop this, and let's go back to our processor, that's perfect. Okay, so in Spring Cloud Stream, as it has been traditionally, you would have a transformation method, right? And that could get kind of long and involved and complex. The way the interface is built now, the way the, way the API is built now, you have the ability to chain different transformation functions, which is really, really powerful, I think. So we'll create another function, taking in a flux of flying passengers. Uh, because we've already converted this flux of passengers to flux of flying passengers, we'll take this flux of flying passengers and create an outgoing flux of flying passengers, and we'll say treat passenger. Now, again, trying to hack the airlines and think how this could be better, I'm sitting there thinking, look, if you're a frequent flyer, who are, oh, yes, 14, oh, thank you very much. Okay, so we do have time. I can, I can relax and breathe a little. All right, so who here is a frequent flyer? Who here spends more of their life in airplanes than they'd like to? Oh, I can't say that, I don't mind, but you know. But who here spends more of their life in airplanes than other normal human beings? All right, so this is for you, right? And again, I'm not gonna subject you to the testing, so I thought, well, I'll subject myself to the testing and we'll see where this goes. So there should be some way to treat a passenger. Uh, so maybe, you know, hey, we recognize that every so often we just give them a really nice bump. What I was, had in mind was something like guaranteed upgrade. Now that would be cool, wouldn't it, right? But again, I'm using me as the guinea pig and I wanted to be realistic. That is never gonna happen, right? It will look something more like this, enhanced, enhanced screening, <laughs> seat by toilets. I'm not complaining. I really enjoy the ambiance that a good toilet produces. Anyway, uh, so I thought, okay, look, we'll just, we'll just change this to treat mark, right? Because this is where, you see where this is going and it's no place good. So, <laughs> so we have our flux coming in, so we'll just do the same thing, return flux, flux, Ooh, typing. It may take 14 minutes at this pace. Yes, this is, this is sad. So I do a flux.map. I'm gonna grab my, my um, well, we'll just call it PAX again. So PAX, PAX, and we'll do a new flying passenger. We'll take our PAX ID, use that. PAX.name, that doesn't change. And then if the PAX.getName equals ignore case is mark, special treat. Yes, you guessed it. So that would be a uh, enhanced, enhanced screening seat by toilets uh, situation there. Otherwise, we'll just use the same uh, incoming uh, status, right? So actually, that would be packs.get status. Perfect. So nobody else has to suffer. We'll work out the kinks and probably ever. Okay, so we're going to take this treat mark. We're going to chain this. Now, I think. This is cool just by itself, right? That's, I mean, it's really neat the things you can do to, to kind of build these complex transitions. It kind of looks a lot like a Linux pipe, right? The neat thing is this is dynamic too because you can externalize this to your environment. So you can change this out and if you have multiple services, you can restart, pick up the new environment and all of a sudden you are processing differently without any change to your code. It's kind of sweet. So let's go ahead and restart this and we'll see how this turns out. And actually, I should go over to my sync now um, let's see here, so boom, and did I copy that in? Nope, I did not. So just to make sure I get uh, the right, and now it's not going to let me go back to my, fine, we'll do this again the hard way. So, there we go, come on IntelliJ. Eclipse isn't sounding so bad now, right? Okay, so there we go, we'll restart our sync. And then we'll go back to our source, and off we go. And that's our processor. We'll go back to our sync. So look at that. There I am, right by the toilets. That's where you can always find me. If you see me there, come back and say hi. <laughs> All right. So that's just kind of a little look 
Yes, we're good. That's kind of a little look forward because that's the API as it's developing. Uh, there are more changes coming, but I think the composability is super, right? Uh, you also have the ability to treat uh, and to, to interact with a reactive stream of values versus just a value at a time, right? So that's valuable. Um, there are some limitations at this point in time. Again, happy to talk about those as we go to, uh, but certainly the groundwork is being laid, the components are falling into place. So that gives you yet another tool in your, your tool belt to deal with more scaling, uh, give you more options for scaling. So with that, let me go back here and we'll stop the source just so I don't let that sit and run and stick me back by the toilet anymore. And we'll go back to our presentation and we'll wrap that up. Okay, so some resources. Uh, all the code you saw here today and more is out into my repo for building reactive pipelines. Please do check it out. Uh, if you see anything that's weird that you don't understand, that you see a better way to do it, let me know that's all good uh, because all this stuff is evolving. And you know what? I'm always learning too, so that's good. Uh, if you want to know more about Spring Cloud Stream, the next link takes you to the project page. You can go from there to the GitHub uh, repo as well. But excellent documentation, I think, that, that kind of lays out uh, several of the questions you might have if you're just getting started or maybe if you're wanting to really tweak it and do some things that you haven't done yet before. Uh, project Reactor homepage. Uh, project Reactor, if I do say so myself, has some really superb documentation out there. So do check it out. Uh, again, it kind of helps you get started if you're not already started with uh, reactive streams. And if you want to reach me by email, those are my two that I check the least infrequently. Uh, so you can ping me there. Uh, better though is on Twitter, MKHeck. So you can shoot me a, a DM. You can shoot me a regular tweet. It's all up to you. And I'm happy to hear from you and discuss this further now as well as afterward. But with that, presentation is done. And uh, thanks for coming. Oh. I should come over on this side. So does anyone have any questions? If you need to leave, that's fine. If you have any questions, though, fire away. Yeah, so, uh, so we used uh, 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 Rabbit MK as a binder, right? Using the Spring Cloud, right? So it's yes. requiring some like, binder. So yes. Use, uh, so in the future, can you use the R socket as a binder? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, this. No Right, yeah. This, this Spring Cloud Stream is built on Spring integration, but it specializes the focus to specifically messaging platforms or messaging options. So if you're talking about, um, I hate to say HTTP-based because our socket isn't just HTTP-based, but uh, it's, it's talking about messaging platforms specifically. Uh, so our socket is a different animal, but yeah, I mean, you would, you would, you would be dealing with uh, reactive streams uh, with publishers across that, but different part of that pipeline, per, potentially. Great question, though. Yeah. Yes? Can, can what run in parallel? Oh, um, you actually would not want to list them sequentially. You could set up multiple consumers or multiple processors to do that, yes. So it's possible, but not the way I showed you. Yeah. Yes? Yes, yes, and in fact, I, I mentioned it earlier, I'm not sure if you had got, come in yet, but uh, we maintain the binder for RabbitMQ and Kafka, as well as Amazon Kinesis. Um, Microsoft maintains a binder for Event Hubs, Google maintains one for Cloud Pub Sub, and then there are a bunch of other binders that are either community or, or partner uh, maintained. But yes, absolutely. Yeah, Apache Kafka is a huge player in this ecosystem and we're, Neck deep in it, so yep, including K streams, whether or Kafka streams. Anyone else? I have a yes. So I guess I could put so this back up. It, it's a more generic question. It's not related specifically to this. But yes. Going, going for like this project loom as being one of the things. Yes. Uh, JVM, which is in, going to improve the performance. How does Reactor play with all of that? Like, do you still feel that Reactor is going to be as efficient? With I, I think it remains to be seen how they all, all the pieces fit together uh, because Reactor solves a very pressing need now. Uh, Loom solves the well, at least there's a large overlap, let's just say. Uh, but Loom is coming two years, four years down the road. It's estimated, I think, to be early access in a year and a half, two years. But let's face it, it's going to take some time for it to get traction. 
so I think reactor and reactive streams is here for the time being. Now, once that happens, I think you're going to see areas where it works really well together. For instance, with Kotlin and coroutines, you can Kotlin coroutines and reactor work very well, integrated well. But um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, and and frankly, there are a lot of cases that make a lot of sense for the the stream processing type of model that Loom just won't address. Um, not to saying it can't be applied to those same problem domains, but it won't have the same tools to address them. So there'll be certain things it will address and certain things that Reactor addresses. And I think there'll be a lot of overlap, but there'll be edge cases that just won't be covered by one or the other that will be covered by the opposite one. So that's my take, but you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll regroup here in three or four years. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thanks. So in the source, you generate one every second. Yes, I'm generating one value per second. And then you have a room to drop in, in back pressure. Um, actually, I, I set it up where we would have back pressure in the case you have a slower consumer. In this case, obviously, no consumer is being stressed. No consumers were harmed in the, the making of this, <laughs> this demo. But, but you typically, when you create a publisher, a flux, uh, you should, out of, a, out of a proper set of practices, define what happens if you were to have a slower consumer. Because you, you, you know, we don't want to assume. So if we weren't just producing one per second, if we were producing a thousand, or maybe even just as many as my machine could produce, what happens if you have a consumer that can't keep up? If you determine what happens on that back pressure, let's say we drop the intervening values, everything's fine. And I think it's a good habit to get into even in these cases, so that you don't forget when it's real. So. Yes. Well, yeah. Well, it depends. Again, if you're looking at a real-time dashboard, you don't care what happened three or ten minutes ago. You care about the state of the system. So it depends on the use case. But you can set up a buffer and tweak that, uh, and determine how you want to address those intervening values. Yeah. So you do have options, uh, but but that's. When anytime you create a flux, you typically should ex exert those options and define what happens if something just can't keep up. Thanks. Yes. Ah, yes. Uh, so if you're interacting with a blocking, uh, blocking database driver and a and a database, uh, that's why RTDBC is an important factor to bring in there because then it redu it eliminates I shouldn't say reduce it eliminates the blocking the interactions with the database. But if you're using a database that doesn't have RTDBC support, um, I, I mean you're you'll still be bottlenecked really. I mean. Well, again, if you're not, I, this is my take. If you're not having any issues scaling-wise, then and you have an existing system that's already built with imperative code, and you're having no issues at all, you don't have wildly fluctuating demand, your scaling issues are minimal or non-existent. I wouldn't necessarily run out and rewrite everything. I would look for better candidates to rewrite where you're solving a pain point. Um, but yeah, if if you have a new system and you I mean, again, we're, we're, still, we're still called to analyze, right? So if we see that, look, we can't pin down where the, 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 the scaling requirements are going to be, or we estimate they're going to be all over the map, sure, I would look at reactive. But I also would not stick a database behind it that you didn't have a reactive driver for. Because if you don't have a reactive channel all the way through the channel, you're, you're inserting a bottleneck in there that wouldn't have to be there, at least a potential bottleneck. <laughs> 